Welcome, 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 Housers, to another episode of On the Way Home. This won't be the first episode to drop in 2024. In fact, there already has been uh, a few. But this is the first one recorded in 2024. So I want to wish all of our listeners the best for 2024 and hope so much. I have so many, my, my hopes are high uh, in the sector for housing and homelessness and health this year. I think we have a lot of brilliant people, many who have been on this podcast, um, doing great work. We share it here. We'll continue to do that and learn from each other. Uh, and, and it just, I'm feeling really positive about the year ahead in all the progress that we're going to make. Uh, thanks for joining us on the podcast. It is brought to you uh, by my group at Blue Door. Now, Blue Door is an organization located in the north of the GTA. We operate in York Region, Durham Region, and Peel Region uh, in the areas of housing, homelessness, and health, uh, and, and help our most vulnerable through all those different pieces, getting healthy, getting meaningful, well-paying work through our construct program, and of course, getting housing at whatever level they're at, whatever need they have, and have many programs around that. Uh, if you want to check us out in more detail, go to bluedoor.ca or just kind of uh, click on the QR code on your screen right now. We do not do this podcast alone, of course. We do it with our fabulous partners at the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. Uh, listen, the Canadian Alliance is a powerhouse. They're huge government advocates for our sector. Um, you know what we talk on the podcast today uh, with the guest about you know five six years ago housing was not top of mind and yes it's top of mind because it, it really we're in a housing crisis but really pushing that forward getting governments to listen CAEH has been one of the uh, national groups that has been at the forefront of that not only providing here's the challenges to government but here's the solutions too uh, they put on a massive conference every year. Uh, in the fall, you should go to it next year. It's going to be in Ottawa. Uh, they do a lot of training. If you want to become a built for zero community, and trust me, you do. It's a, a big part of ending homelessness. They do that and so much more. So check out their website at caeh.ca to see all the wonderful work they are doing. Hey, week to week, we have experts, lived experts, uh, experts uh, that are researchers, that are, are housing advocates that are uh, working in the housing homelessness sector. Uh, and quite often we have experts that are legal experts. And that's this week's guest. Uh, he's been on so frequent. I think uh, John Fox, who's our guest today, is a manager at Robbins Appleby. Uh, he is our, our number one guest, right? He's been on many times. And I love talking to John. He loves this stuff. He's passionate about it. He's brilliant. And it shows in the podcast uh, every time. And we get lost and sidetracked into a bunch of different conversations. But I hope you find it interesting. And I hope uh, you find uh, it helpful as well. This week, we talk about uh, in on to the province of Ontario in the last year and a half. John just put out a blog with uh, another uh, one of his team members at Robbins Appleby. I think it's Amanda Briggs uh, more. more so. And, and so they put out a blog and he came on to talk about it. And it really talks about there was uh, four new bills that were passed in a year and a half. One of those bills he talks about in the podcast uh, was passed, I think, in two weeks, which is crazy because it has to go through a number of readings and there's a whole process to it. So to have four of them passed in a year and a half and actually pass, be passed as, as laws, um, is incredible. Uh, and there's a lot of criticism around it. And so John and I, John breaks down those uh, what those bills were. He talks a lot of, about them. Uh, he talks about the positive pieces coming out of those, uh, around the speed and the thought process behind it. Uh, he talks about where they could get better, where maybe they missed the mark. Uh, and then also talks about suggestions for moving forward, what has to happen, uh, and his thoughts around that, and much, much more. We we, we talk about those pieces, and we, we talk about different examples of what's happening in the city of Toronto. I share a little bit of uh, sometimes what's happened at Pluto as well, but it's a great conversation. And for someone, for many of us who are, you know, maybe don't understand government legislation, um, as much as, as others, I found it really enlightening and uh, impactful. I hope you enjoy this podcast uh, as much as I did. Let's go to it now. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Uh, we chatted uh, off air about this, but you are our number one guest. You have graced us with your presence uh, and 
your uh, expertise so many times. We're grateful for that. So thank you once again for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Oh, it's my honor. It's my privilege. Now, you've like I just said you've had um, you've had to answer this question about five times already, and I don't know if you're you. It, maybe some elements might say the same, but it, I think we ask people, "What does home mean to you?" And, and that might change from time to time as your experience changes. So I don't know if it has for you, but I'm going to throw that out to you. What does home mean to you, and has, has that changed over time? You know, I don't prepare for this by reviewing my previous answers to the same question. So I'm sure that it has a certain evolution. But as it turns out, as uh, we were just chatting uh, before we went on, I'm actually a little under the weather today. And so home uh, is a place where I am allowed to recover from that while doing a podcast and um, and, and sort of gather my strength to go and meet the world uh, tomorrow. And it is a tremendous um benefit to me personally and is to anybody else uh, to have a home where you can uh, recuperate when things aren't aren't going exactly as you would like. It's a great answer. Often we hear, especially from uh, amazing people like Dr. Andrew Bazzari and, and Dr. Nahid uh, Tassani, um, when they say home is health, health is home, you are a demonstration of that today when people are not healthy or they're, they're needing to get healthy, they need a home to do that in. And I'm grateful that you have that uh, and a great, great thought on uh, on that today. Listen, I'd ask you about your journey. We have uh, gone through that before, but you've been really, really busy as of late. Um, as this airs, we're just into 2024. Everyone always hopes the holidays are going to slow down a bit, but they don't. Can you talk a little bit about what have you been up to as of late? Well, uh, per, per- one of the neat things uh, about my role professionally or my uh, my perch in the housing sector is I see uh, different things across different client groups. So it's not just Blue Door. It's not just another group. It's a, sort of a, you can see certain trends. And so some of the trends that we've been seeing both in sector organizations and with individuals is the concept of unleashing uh, equity or you know unused uh, value in nonprofit properties to the benefit of the housing sector. And you see that coming out in two or three different ways. Uh, you and I were both at the Ontario Nonprofit Housing Association meetings. And uh, one of the large parts of the discussion was about mergers. And one of the reasons that people are interested in mergers is the notion that uh, as a larger group, you would be able to deploy and create more housing using existing uh, resources that are not really available when, when, the, when the sector is as split up as it is. So that's one thing we're seeing. Another thing I'm seeing a lot more of, which I'm really happy about, is more effort going into the preservation of existing affordable housing uh, stock, which I'm happy to, to talk about in more in more detail. But it's it's really important for everyone to recognize that when the government talks about the creation of new homes and they say we need to create a certain number of new homes that every time somebody uh, loses an affordable uh, home we're kind of negative uh, one in that in that score and it's not just about the number of homes that are created it's the number of affordable units that are actually left at the end of the day and so when we see real activity and thought going into creating or preserving affordable units at scale, that's a very positive thing. Yes, and and it's interesting. I saw an article recently that uh, CHRA, the Canadian Housing Renewal Association, Ray Sullivan put out around that, around hoping for an acquisition strategy uh, in the next federal budget and the need for that. Uh, A friend of mine, Abe uh, Utzhorn, pushed back a little bit. He said, you know, I'm all for that. He said, but wouldn't, um, wouldn't, rent controls or, or, or good measures around rent controls do the same thing, keep things affordable too. And my answer to that is why not have both? I mean, why, why can't we do both? I don't think there's one, it wasn't either or. Um, and I think he was just a little worried about the acquisitions if it's uh, acquired in the wrong hands. Maybe that, that's what he was saying. Right. Well, I mean, part of the uh, an acquisition strategy that is aimed at creating a pool of below market housing um, is one where you're going to end up end up with 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 it in the hands of a nonprofit. So there, the the benefit that comes out of it is still within the closed system that a nonprofit corporation is. That there's no there's no way to dividend money out to the members and stuff like that. So that when I'm talking about that, that's really what I'm talking about: the creation of more units in the hands of people whose intention is to keep uh, rent affordable and who are going to manage uh, their, the asset accordingly. 
And you've you've helped, I think, many with that, uh, including uh, Bludar in establishing land trusts that do exactly that, right? The whole idea is to, in perpetuity, mm-hmm. keep that asset affordable forever. Um, and, exactly. and I know the uh, City of Toronto has, I think it's Mira is the name of the program acquisition that has helped right. uh, Parkdale and Raising the Roof and others really do exactly that. So let's mm-hmm. let's uh, hope we have a broader, and I, I know they're doing some great stuff in BC around that too, but a broader federal um, acquisition strategy would be great. We've had guests on here. I mean, it's gone for all over the place. I've heard anywhere from for every new build, we lose seven to depending on, we can lose up to 20 uh, per new build or depending where. Um, and I, I think, and depending on who you ask, right? But it's crumbling infrastructure or just being lost to that that private sector. But I think everyone would agree, as you've often said, is that it's not just about new supply. It's the type of supply. It's also about preserving what we have right now uh, as well. That's so right. let's I, I'm talk. Gonna, I'm going to take that as one segue to talk about one extra thing, which is yeah, my, yeah, my, favorite, sure. my favorite my uh, favorite file right now, which I'm going to talk obtusely about because <laughs> it's uh, still sort of behind the cloak of privilege. Uh, but uh, I have an example on my desk now where a group of tenants is looking to buy their own building. So they form themselves up into a cooperative and are attempting to purchase their own building. And that is, that's to my mind, that is the kind of thing where to the extent that there is a gap, uh, the, the public sector should be stepping in because it will always be the smallest gap that you can imagine. And if it goes private, the same equity gap in, in that you need to complete the acquisition is going to be made up by an increase in rent. Like we all know where the money is going to come from after the fact. So I think when we spot those kinds of opportunities, uh, we on the in the sector and the and the and the public sector need to be opportunistic in, in grabbing those kinds of units and keeping them uh, affordable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I can say just from our, our own experience with my my own organization that we've done that through reaching home, through different foundations, through uh, sometimes in the sector, people, there are people that are doing the opposite where they're saying, look, uh, property management or, or looking after us, that, that is not what we want to do. And in fact, when you talk about the merger piece a little bit, it bleeds over into that where I know there's there's certain groups that have been managing housing for years and have found it quite taxing. And they're saying, look, our, our board's getting older. We're having trouble getting right. members. What do we do with these 30 odd homes? And that's where these, these mergers and different uh, acquisitions have to happen to, you know, to also make sure those homes can be managed and maybe a little more efficiently and effectively within a bigger organization, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's right. So you, you can definitely marshal equity better in a large organization for the, the same way the BC Land Trust uh, does it. Uh, and so, but we're a ways away from that because there's no taking away the, some of those, some small, smaller, because the board is smaller, does it make the board less passionate or less committed or less alive to the culture that they've created in their own buildings? And so these are easier things to say than do. Uh, and there are alternative methods currently on, in play, including borrowing methods. You, you, that's being developed by the Center for Transformation Community Housing uh, in Ottawa. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess sometimes uh, I find um, there's smaller organizations doing really important, impactful work. And, and I'll get off the segue in a minute. We'll get into talking about legislation. But there's smaller organizations and that passion is there. But it's also, I don't know if it's ego or something stopping them, that if we continue down this path, we're going to cease to exist. If we come together with other groups or another group and become, our mission will continue maybe a little differently as uh, uh, in a merger. But I, I, I hope that always that boards are able to say this is not about us or our legacy or this is about the people we serve and the communities we serve. And if we're going to continue to do that, this might be the best way forward. And I, I think a lot are going to be there's going to be a lot of people facing those decisions, organizations facing those decisions as dollars get fewer and fewer over time. For sure. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit uh, today. There's always lots going on at the provincial level, always not great, uh, especially what we're hearing uh, in the news, um, but lots of activity. Everyone is working hard, uh, but in the last year and a half, we've seen some major movement, and you wrote a blog about it um, all around Ontario housing legislation in the last year and a half. They put uh, four major bills through, which is, and I'm hoping you'll, you'll talk about that a little bit, that is 
that, that, that's not usual, right? Like that's pretty breakneck speed. Uh, but before we get to them, maybe I'm hoping you could provide a little context on how the heck did we get to kind of this spot where these things needed to happen or what, what was kind of the precursor to this? Well, that, that, I mean, the precur the, these things need to happen because the, the government began to describe housing in terms of uh, the crisis that it is. And we can talk about uh, whether or not the legislation addresses all parts of the crisis. And in the end, you'll ask me what, where I think the government needs to focus next, and that, that will lead right into that answer. Uh, but coming to coming to power, they were recognizing that they needed to do something under their under pressure from their own even their own constituents, and they came up with uh, they've passed effectively four bills in 18 months, which is um, a lot of bills, including a couple of um, uh, course corrections along the way. So I actually I know that it's tempting to refer to course corrections as flip flops. I, I I don't think anybody should be criticized for learning on the go, and that includes the government. And uh, to the extent that they have made changes which are positive, I, I think that should simply be recognized and 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 moved moved on. And they and they have done that on a couple of uh, pieces, including uh, development charge deferrals and the definition of and how they're defining uh, income. And they have ways to go uh, because it's it, it's very challenging to implement some of those those definitions in real life. So there are certainly some things that they have to cope with, but the, the, I often say that you, you can agree or not agree, but you cannot say that they have not been activists on this file in terms of legislation. And they have responded to some things which are, are the call of the development community, some which are beneficial to nonprofits, but fewer than, than the development community, but also quite a bit where both uh, benefit. So if you'd like, I can go into talking about that legislation. Well, they also, and I know you and I have talked about this before, they struck, and part of that was striking that task force, yes. which came back with recommendations, which then, I, I yeah. mean, probably informed some of this legislation. Is that right? That's right. So it, it, that, that task force, uh, which was a, a really good, broad uh, group of people, was really aiming their, uh, and stated this, that their focus was really on delivering additional supply into market housing far more than how to deliver supply at below in, in the below market uh, genre and a lot of the legislation that comes out is effectively directly following that so they, they did have one which came out uh, before bill 108 but then the rest has really followed along those recommendations and attempted to implement uh, some of the things that they had seen in there Let's talk about uh, the legislation that has happened uh, quite quickly over the last year and a half. Yeah, it only happens quickly in terms of the speed of individual acts. It also happens quickly in terms of the gap of time between uh, an act being introduced and it becoming law. So uh, we, be, when an act is introduced in the legislature, it doesn't become law right away. It goes through three readings, often goes through committee, and it becomes law when it receives royal assent from the lieutenant governor. In the case of, for example, Bill 109, which I just I happen to have the note in front of me, that that gap of time was March 30th to April 14th. That that is wow. an incredibly fast, uh, an incredibly fast result. So, they um, they felt they wanted needed to put stuff in place, and and they they did, and, and a lot of it related to um, sort of a classic uh, conservative uh, whipping uh, person. The, the uh, red tape and so they they went after um, the speed with which municipalities are processing applications they went after um, frivolous complaints to the Ontario Land Tribunal uh, all kinds of things which have slowed uh, down the creation of, of um, housing and you can s certainly see in the reactions that came out after Bill 109 and later Bill 23 uh, pushback on the part of those who felt that there was that left not enough room for consultation uh, for the public. Uh, however, for most of us who are in, who have been involved, there's been so such a such a heavy load of frivolous um, complaints that delay stuff. That for both the nonprofits and for the for-profits, this kind of of uh, 
uh, streamlining was is probably on balance welcome. And it's one of those instances where if you accept that housing is a crisis and you need to develop it faster and time is money, whether it's public money or private money, then streamlining this process is on balance probably the right thing. It, I, I, my view is it's the right thing. It's the right thing to do. And as I like to tell the, the some of the, the for-profit guys who complain about uh, neighbors complaining. Uh, I, I, I think that the nonprofit developers I know have it even more so uh, with people complaining about things like traffic and parking when they're really saying something totally different. And so some of that stuff hopefully uh, will be moved aside. There has never really been a history of, of, of uh, cost awards against groups coming with those kinds of complaints in part because nobody wants to put costs on a citizen complaint. Uh, but hopefully this will help to dissuade some of that kind of stuff and speed the creation of housing. And there's nothing, you know, there, there is, I, I like to say there's nothing wrong with that. There is, obviously, there is a, a giving up of certain intervention rights on the part of the public in order to achieve that. Uh, but when we're talking, these things are not perfect and it's a compromise and on balance, I thought that was a, a good thing to do. They then also did some cost reduction measures, including uh, controlling development charges for for uh, for profit development, and ultimately in the in the, one of the last bills, they eliminated development charges for nonprofit development entirely. Now, I, I know from speaking to others that sometimes when we talk about development charges, people assume that's a couple hundred bucks a unit. It's not. It's it's like fifty thousand dollars a unit. So you start multiplying um, that those numbers out. Uh, over a, a two or 300 unit development. And let's face it, we're, we're going to start needing developments of that magnitude in order to deal with this issue. You're talking a lot of money. Uh, so when that came to pass, uh, there's obviously um, a concern in the municipalities about uh, the loss of development charge revenue. They are no longer allowed to to charge development charges as uh, for housing infrastructure, which is the source, Michael, of some of the money that you and I are used to placing through things like contributions and the like. And so to a certain extent, there's a uh, there's a, a, a drama there that has not fully played out uh, with in, in, in light of those complaints, the government has turned and said that they would make municipalities whole. Uh, not sure what that means just yet, uh, but one would expect that at some point in time, uh, municipalities will simply send a uh, rendering of how much has been they did not collect and ask for that money uh, and we don't know yet how the government would, will react to that but based on what they say they'll react by cutting a check and what you're seeing then is a transfer from development charges to the to the tax base income tax base of those costs and if you go back in time to things developers have said all along, that's largely what they have said all along, that these are costs which should not be borne by individual projects, they're costs should be borne by society at large. I think I've meandered a little bit from the original question uh, into those two big themes, uh, but those are, are two, of the, two of the big themes that came out of that collection of legislation. Now, it's, it's interesting with that legislation because this government also has... Uh, taking some criticism and some praise for the number of MZOs that they put through, right? Yeah. I, I believe, I think it was the the wind government before them did about two, and, and this government's yeah. done quite a number. But with this legislation, it might cut down if there's a greater speed and in, in those uh, land tribunal pieces uh, are, are fewer. It might even cut down on the need for that, right? Well, they've also created a mechanism where the it's the municipalities are often the ones asking for the uh, M, the, the ministerial zoning orders, and so you know to the extent that uh, that that the ministerial zoning orders are cutting time off the creation of affordable units, I'm I, as I'm personally all in favor of that because of the the speed with which we need to create those units. Uh, it it is possible that with legislation you would see them slow slow down with that and allow the process as we knew it to carry out. I should say the process as we knew it subject to the changes I just talked about with hopefully fewer frivolous complaints, uh, but where people with legitimate issues are going to come and, and make their case to the, to the OLT without having the province intervene in quite that way. Yeah, I, I know that uh, for us, uh, Blue Door put one through, through, and the town of Newmarket was wonderful yeah. putting it through. It, and so fortunately, we got kind of caught up in, in the busy times that are happening now uh, with the government and still have hopes uh, for that. But it really, the, the cost savings there and the speed of which th that MZO will help 
to get affordable units, as you were saying, done quickly. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and for uh, those most in need, uh, will be uh, greatly sped up in, in the cost savings will, will be huge. Let's yeah. talk about there's other pieces, there's other major bills there. Yeah. Um, there's four of them. And I think when you broke it down to your blog, you did it almost like a dinner menu, right? You said, here's yeah. like the, the appetizer, yeah. this is the main course. I think you talked a little bit maybe about the main course and the dessert, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, it, so, so I, I kind of refer to Bill 109, which was their first one as as an, as an a bit of an amuse-bouche because there's only so much – uh, really in it, but a lot of it is this cutting of red tape business and the creation of uh, the community infrastructure and housing accelerator, which is a, a tool for zoning and that kind of stuff. But the the real dinner time when they really start implementing is is build is Bill 23, and in Bill 23 they do stuff like amend the Development Charges Act to eliminate. Uh, uh, development charges for nonprofits, but also on affordable housing generally. So, if a for-profit is um, is uh, building something that it, it qualifies as 80 percent uh, at 80 percent average market rent, then it is entitled to receive its own development charge uh, exemption, and that that created some pushback on the grounds that very difficult to implement those definitions the government never actually set out how to how to calculate average market rent and still hasn't so you can appreciate that depending on what the catchment area is you could end up with a massive definition of affordability so for example if you said that average market rent for the city of toronto was the whole city of toronto including all rent paid in new buildings in downtown toronto a lot of rent in the outlying areas of toronto would be affordable by definition and any new creation there would be exempt. So you would, you, the, the city was uh, found that problematic. And uh, as a result, it has, it has proven a difficult thing for people to really judge as to how, how that's going to work out as in the, for, for, for a private provider. A nonprofit is exempt, as I say, by, uh, by definition. And, and people have been very, very critical uh, of a lot of this. I mean, as you said, I, I think, you know, the, the intention of all this is let's create more housing. Let's do it now. There's been uh -huh. talk about, you said it yourself. All right, let's not just talk about housing. What about the affordable piece? The task force, I think, was actually named the Affordable Housing Task Force, but it should, it should have been uh, the Housing Supply Task Force because that's more of the yeah. focus. Uh, so there's been some criticisms, but let's take a look at the positives. Let's start there. Well, the, the, like the, the positive to me is a willingness to engage in this kind of this kind of legislation, and the notion that you are exempt as a nonprofit developer does put a tool in the hands of nonprofit developers, which is important. So, for a nonprofit developer competing for a piece of land, they are going to be able to to basically offer. Um, uh, make offers on the basis of a development that does not require the payment of development charges, which a for-profit guy cannot do. So those are positive things for the nonprofit um, community. And I do think some of the interventions in the municipal planning system were were worthwhile. I, I don't think there's enough done with respect to preserving existing affordable units here. And we cannot build fast enough to replace those. So there there is definitely room for criticism as to what is not there and there's there's in, in what i refer to as dinner again question mark in my uh, blog which was after dessert there's a the, the the bill after bill 23 which is when most people talk about was called bill 97 and it dealt with two simple things one is um a uh, uh, additional uh, additional restraints on landlords doing what we tend to commonly call renovations. And the second one was to allow the minister to eliminate, oh, I shouldn't say that, to allow the minister to pass uh, rules relating to rental replacement. I, I think I've talked about that, that on this show before. I, I don't think the government should be eliminating rental replacement legislation in Toronto, which is the only place that really exists in, on, in Ontario, but they've given themselves the authority to do that. The subsequent bill that came out, which has actually drawn a lot of criticism from the building community itself, um, changed uh, the rules in relation to what is an affordable rent and what is an affordable unit. And it changed it to going, uh, it, dr it drifted the provincial policy in the legislation further from the average market rent, average market price approach 
closer to what had been in the city of Toronto's inclusionary zoning rules in the sense that income now became a factor. And so affordable rental, this is the only time I'm going to read, by the way, in this whole thing, but this one, I it's so hard to get this right. Um, affordable rental housing, rent must be no greater than the lesser Okay, you got to love that, right? So already everybody's like, oh my God. What? No greater than the lesser of 30% of the 60th percentile income for rental households in the municipality and the average market rent identified for the residential units set out in a residential units bulletin. So if you apply, it seems complicated, but it actually the way the city of Toronto has been doing it, you actually see which one of those two would apply by going on their website and sometimes it's one and sometimes it's the other but there's now kind of a cap associated with what would a a somebody at the 60th percentile be able to pay in order to make this work and if you think that's complicated and when you translate that into affordable ownership in order to get to a price which makes that kind of thing work you've got to make assumptions about the rental rate and the down payment and so on but if you do, then you come up with different prices in different parts of the province because the actual in income piece is, is different in different parts of the province. So the, the 60th percentile income in Toronto is not the same as it is in Ottawa or Kitchener. So if you're building out, um, uh, if you're building out definitions on that basis, you're going to find there's different applications across the province. So I think there's some homework to do uh, in being able to apply that. And it, there's a, that also means there's a, there's a different subsidy. Like I, I, with the help of uh, one of your other frequent guests at Habitat, uh, they calculated out on some of those assumptions. And I, I put this in my blog what that means, and it you know it translates to uh, buying a home for two hundred seventy five thousand dollars without any real distinct in Toronto for without any real distinction on size. So you know, assuming you have an average price of a million bucks, that's an implicit subsidy of seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So how does that all kind of come to play and work? And they also uh, the, the other criticism within the ownership community of this legislation is that it 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 seems to ignore how the habitats and the trilliums and the options have done this for years, which is to say we're going to focus on we're going to focus on how much our resident is having to pay, that that is actually what's affordable. The the price of the unit is a market price of the unit. And so in, in those models, you you the market price you would pay it from to the developer is the same as the guy next door, but you would have a second mortgage with no payments so that what so 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 that the mortgage that you're actually paying is affordable to you. And that means that you're never going to get a windfall because you're always going to have to pay back the uh, the second mortgage it, the legislation focuses focuses exclusively on price so if price is 80 percent of the average market price just to pick the simpler example and you've raised your kids there and now you're 20 years uh it's 20 years on you're not going to move and make way in those next five years you're going to wait till the thing expires at the 25th year and sell your house for a full market value that doesn't make any sense to me. And so I would like to see them recalibrate those definitions and that approach to basically focus in on the, what somebody is actually paying. Yeah, and listen, I mean, it doesn't matter who's in government, they don't always get it right the first time around. And if they're open to listening and feedback in which people are, are very willing to give, um, those changes yeah. can happen, right? Oh, absolutely. I'm and I'm I'm happy to give feedback to anybody who asks me <laughs> about it. And uh, my number is available on our website. So uh, by all means, if you're listening and thinking you want to talk about this more, you can certainly give me a give me a call. I had a couple of calls from mayoral candidates over the course of time. And while one listened to me more than the others, uh, certainly my message was always I, I will give feedback to anybody who cares to hear what I have to say. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity to give the feedback uh, that feedback here with you guys. Uh, it's good to know. I mean, I think a lot of it comes out. Um, the the layperson understands a little bit of it, but there's nuances in there that you've kindly helped us kind of wrap our heads around too to say, okay, what does this mean moving forward? Uh, you had a number of, all right, let's talk about, we've talked a little bit about this, but maybe just more concrete, like where do they miss the mark? And you had a number of suggestions. Hey, here's where yeah. we go moving for, from here. This has happened. Okay, done. How do we move forward and, and what are some areas we really got to focus on? Yeah, so uh, let me approach that a slightly different 
way than I had in my blog because there was something that happened between my blog and and now, which is the Mayor Chow came out with a, her plan to ad, advance 65,000 below market units and so on. And the, the question to a certain extent is, is she is she right? And I, I have to think that to a large extent, she is she is right in the sense that until there's a greater supply of below market housing, all the supply of at market housing is not going to help eliminate, reduce the load on shelters, create housing for a whole slew of people who are in between uh, that market level and what they what they can afford. And to a large extent, the government legislation, save for those few things I've mentioned specifically like the development charge exemption has focused on overall supply and has not focused on below market supply. So when she talks about 65,000 units, it feels radical because of where we've been in the last 30 years. But if you stretch your history, your history, history and have housing in Canada past that point, past the Mike Harris government, past the Jean Chrétien government, you'll come to a time where we were producing those, that level of housing and not, not perhaps not coincidentally, uh, the housing market itself was not unreachable for people operating at, at the market level. And so to a certain extent, I, you, you kind of wonder whether or not in order to achieve the stated goal of the provincial government to make housing affordable, Mayor Chow's approach is actually almost a necessary precondition. So some of the things that I, I was uh, suggesting, which are you know, sort of not run, a, run of the mill uh, things, uh, or things that we've got into before, like the Perpetuities Act, it would be things like forcing the preservation of existing um, housing by making it more dif more difficult, or at least I should say, uh, make repairs that are known to a buyer of residential housing be part of the purchase price rather than a rental increase by not allowing above guideline increases until uh, after a sale for a period of time. Uh, I think those are important things to help preserve the existing uh, stock. Uh, being aggressive and opportunistic in the acquisition of uh, existing stock when there are opportunities of, uh, available is important. It does cost money. Uh, setting up the systems where we are borrowing what we can like everybody else, so our capital stacks when you're acquiring, a, a, uh, acqu uh, acquiring uh, housing like that is not just paying out cash dollar for dollar from the tax base is important. Uh, and then there are there were a few other things I had I had recommended, uh, we had recommended as well with my, uh, I say we because I wrote this with my colleague, uh, Amelia Briggs Morris at, uh, at, my, at my law firm, which we thought would be helpful. I mentioned briefly the Perpetuities Act and that's because it gets in the way of having long-term affordable ownership. And I think that is something which the government could easily um, deal away with and make it easier for organizations like, uh, like Habitat or Trillium or Options to create housing which is owned but is is then controlled in its resale value and then stays uh, uh, affordable into the into the future. Uh, and they, my full list is available on online but those are three I'd, I'd care to emphasize for sure. We had uh, we had Tyler Meredith on a while back, and he talked about, and it's something I didn't really understand. He said when you talk you talk about affordability, the governments do, and everyone's saying we don't have enough money. But if you're utilizing government land to build on, he said that actually um, on the balance sheet you're actually increasing, like your balance sheet looks better. So if if the federal yes. government has land and so it builds something on there and they still own that land and it's still on the balance sheet. It's never come off. It's not a deficit because they haven't given that land, right? It now has actually increased in value. So on the balance sheet, even though they're supporting that. So there's ways, there's creative ways to do this uh, and all levels of government are, are, I think that's part of their plan is looking through their portfolio yeah. of land and buildings. Well, I, I certainly think that one of the my favorite quotes recently from the premier was that housing should not be a political football, and it's it's a tremendously challenging thing to resist have making it a political football. Um, but I don't. I think one of the preconditions to getting through this is, if we are treating this as a crisis, then we will be taking our ideas from across the political spectrum and doing our best to implement them. And even when they are rejected, we're not going to just say nasty things about the other guy for the purposes of getting elected on this particular issue. We'll save that for something else. Uh, but 
there's a lot at there's a lot at stake here. It's easy for me to say I'm I'm sitting in my my house as we speak, but if you are having trouble getting a shelter bed, or you have arrived recently from abroad and it's not available for you in Toronto, or you are trying to find a place to live and have read that what the average market rent is in some blog that a guy like me doesn't realize that you can't rent anything in Toronto at the average market rent in Toronto, uh, then this is really uh, critical for you that we we do this. And when we keep that in mind, hopefully some of the other stuff can move to the side and we can live up to the housing should not be political football uh, uh, mantra. And I think I think we have seen some of that. I, I've seen the federal government uh, in its its new minister uh, be quite complimentary of some of the things the province has done and vice versa publicly in any event. And I think that kind of thing should uh, should continue. Whoever is in power is just going to have to partner with all levels of government in order to make this happen. Absolutely, uh, and, and you know I think we we've seen that uh, we've seen gaps sometimes uh, at one point, and I, I think it was uh, our prime minister said. Uh, you know, housing is not, well, I think what he meant to say is, is it's not all on us, but what came out was it's not really our, you know, our gig, it's more provincial, uh, and, and there was a lot of pushback, obviously, and then the housing yeah. minister, Sean Fraser, walked that back, yeah. and said, of course it is, uh, but but they were saying, it, and I think what the, was he was trying to say is just what you did. It's going to take all levels of government, really. It's not not just us. We could throw all the money we want at it, but if pieces provincially and locally, you know, well, don't change, you know, stuff doesn't get done. Right, right. Well, I, I definitely think he was not meaning to say we want to have nothing to do with this. Uh, we, we, I mean, just before Christmas, there's almost a half a billion dollars made available to Toronto through the Housing Accelerator Fund. And the city of Toronto, uh, which could have reacted saying, keep your, keep your ideas about our zoning rules uh, to yourself, federal government uh, just turned and said, well, we agree with you, we have to be faster. So let's make it faster and take this money and try and get this, get this job, uh, get, get that money placed as the beginning of, of Mayor Chow's uh, campaign here to get this, get, get 65,000 homes. It's a real challenge to do that. I'm not ever going to understate how hard it will be to create that. But I think that uh, stating that objective is still a positive contribution to this discussion. And there's there's talks right now. We were just talking with uh, our local MP yesterday and saying that talks are hopefully getting close to the point with around uh, the disability pension, right? And some changes to that uh, because obviously we've talked on this podcast a lot of housing is a big, big part of, of solving the crisis, of course, affordable, deeply affordable housing. Income is too, right? If you're able to have incomes that can rise up to those amounts that we're, we're are now defining as, uh, you know, average, you know, then, then there's less of an issue, right? People can uh, afford the current stock and new stock, and uh, it opens up spaces in shelters for people who, who might need that emergency 24-7 around the clock expensive uh, care, right? Because we have people right now in the system that are saying, look, I don't need to be here. I just don't have an option, right? Like there's not, right. I just need affordable housing. I really don't uh, need all the surrounding services around it. So I think supply uh, in the end, supply is and deeply affordable supply, of course, is, is going to make a difference. And I think all levels of government, as we're seeing provincially through this legislation, we're seeing it federally, locally, housing, affordable housing, homelessness is on the minds of uh, everyone. Uh, and and it is now when they, they talk about elections, it's the number one issue, which five years ago, this was not the case, right? It's true. Right. And puts the pressure where things need to get done. The federal housing minister recently talked about a new housing plan, uh, hopefully coinciding with the uh, upcoming spring budget. So we will see. We will see for sure. We will see for sure. And we'll see how what they say is we can translate through provincial, the province and through the city to the deliver, to deliver actual housing as quickly as we, as, as possible. Like it, it is a, it is hard to draw it, get it from, from uh, the, the, the thought and idea all the way into an actual roof over somebody's head. It takes years. Uh, and every year we can slice off that or once we slice off that, the, uh, the better. So those are things I thought were good in that legislation, for example, and, Collected, collected with cash uh, will be very helpful. Is there any final thoughts as we, uh, we were kind of, that legislation closed up in 2023? We've got a new housing minister, have had for some time, and that also threw 
kind of a different spin to things because some things uh, not necessarily with this were, were walked back and changed. And you said that's not always a bad thing, right? It's reflection and, and you got to pivot sometimes in, in, in mid movement. Um, what are your hopes for the next few months? I, 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 I almost think I just uh, laid those out a bit. I, I really do hope that we will move to a place where we're recognizing that it's not just about uh, supply at the margin, that we are here to solve everybody's uh, housing uh, issues, uh, that the, the role of the government is to provide housing for everyone. And so, uh, or not, maybe not directly, but to provide the, the, the policy framework within which housing can be de developed for everybody. And that means making sacrifice along along the way. So not everything is going to be aimed at housing on the margin at market and so on. And while supply there is great, it's going to be great for a group of people who would otherwise be falling just short of buying. And you and I know there are a lot of people who are falling way short of buying and way short of mm -hmm. renting. So pushing uh, uh, supply into that space is important and we get there by being honest with ourselves about about uh, who is responsible for that. I, I was uh, struck by um, an article in uh, the uh, Toronto Star before Christmas time uh, about how the number of investors that own real estate in Toronto and and um, one of the things I always I take from that is there's what the investors have done in in that case is exactly what they would have be should be expected to do and the private sector done exactly what it is expected to do but it has not resulted in the creation of units for people who cannot afford units at the market level so the policy that that started that where we were withdrawing from the creation of public housing and supportive housing at the government level is not resulted in the in the system that I think is going to be a long term benefit to Canada or to anywhere else, and I don't think you can point to anywhere in the world where the private sector on its own has has uh, housed everybody because that's not what the private sector is there to do. So I, I think what I hope is that we'll come to that recognition and begin to fill in. Um, we are filling in, we've begun to fill in, but we'll continue to push hard to fill in the gap in housing that is not driven at market prices. I mean, it, you, you said, I think, at the beginning of the podcast, it was kind of pre-1990, uh, where government kind of stepped back and was hoping, as you just said, the private market will market will take care of it. It has not resulted. That has not worked. They're back in the game at all levels. Uh, it was a long slide. So to get back, it's going to take some time. I, I can understand why people aren't patient, because when you don't have a roof over your head, that is a uh, a tough way to stay healthy uh, and move forward. But I think there's some good things happening. We always appreciate your insight and time uh, and your life. If someone wants to check out the blog, read it in fall, or go back and look at some other pieces you've written, where can they go? Robinsappleby.com. And if you look up my name, you'll find all the blogs that uh, that I've written on on housing. Amazing. John, wishing you a speedy recovery. Thanks for, you know, getting up. Uh, well, I don't think you were in your sick bed, but for not for feeling under the weather and still joining us to share some wisdom. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll see you next time on the way it's home. It's my pleasure.